Bill was the leader and CEO of the largest ministry in the world. He's a fellow Presbyterian. His ministry, you might recognize it, its name is Campus Crusade for Christ, and Bill Bright was the man in charge. His ministry have led untold millions of people to Christ during the time that it's been in existence. I can remember one time when Bill was wronged by somebody, and, and everybody knew it, and somebody asked him if he was going to claim his rights. The answer he gave was tremendously humble. Here's what he said. I have no rights. Many years ago, I gave my life to Christ, and now I am a slave of Jesus. That comment and that perspective comes from the scripture that we're going to read this morning. Here the Apostle Paul gives up his rights to do what he calls for the sake of winning people for Christ. Listen to what he says. The scripture is 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in its blessings. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have an attorney present during questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you at government expense. These are called your what? Miranda rights. They're going to offer those. Well, let me start by saying I hope you've not had that offered to you any time recently. <laughs> if you do, we still love you. But you hear that when you're about to be arrested or when you're going to be asked some questions that will probably make you look guilty, the law officer reads the Miranda rights to you. What is the first time line of the Miranda rights say? You have the right to what? Remain silent. As an American citizen, you have the right to remain silent. As a Christian, and as a servant of Jesus, I do not, repeat, do not have the right to remain silent about this life that God offers through Jesus Christ. If I were to offer you the cure to cancer, would you keep it silent? Or would you feel like you're bursting on the inside that this news, this great news has to be known because many, many people need to hear it? Most of us would be bursting inside. God provides the answer, and Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. It's a matter of receiving his offer. To all who received him, he gave the power to become children of God. If you're a Christian and you're sitting on the cure for the world that the world needs, you're probably bursting inside that that might be known. If you aren't a Christian yet, it's simple to receive this offer that God has for you. You can bow your head or keep your eyes open and pray a simple prayer like this, and it'll change your life and the lives of people around you forever. To pray this simple prayer, God, I need to have my past forgiven. I need to have a reason for living. I, I accept your offer of a home in heaven. Someone has once written the believer's rights. It goes this way. I do not have the right to remain silent. 
everything that I say can and will be used to witness to others about the love and the forgiveness of Christ. I have the right to speak to anyone who's willing to listen and to have the Holy Spirit present at all times. I like that one. If anyone is willing to listen, then I may speak with my actions of love, kindness, and forgiveness. I'll never forget the morning after I prayed to entrust my life to Jesus Christ. My friend Barry was with me, and I asked him not to tell anybody. I swore him to silence because I didn't want anybody to know what had just happened. I thought that sometime, maybe in the distant future, I might be doing that, but not right now. We walked into a room at college. Several of my friends stopped. After two or three minutes, people stopped talking and started looking at me. Something is different about you, they said. What has happened? And at first I denied it. I said, oh, nothing. In 30 minutes, I couldn't restrain myself from telling people about the forgiveness and the inner peace that I experienced when I prayed to ask Jesus into my life. I freely and gladly gave up the right to remain silent. It was going to, I was just going to burst with this good news. Luke 19, verse 40 says, and this is when Jesus, remember the time Jesus, I don't know what his disciples were doing, but they were very emotional and ecstatic and filled with joy in their worship. And the Pharisees were offended by the worship of Jesus' disciples. And what the Pharisees were saying was, could you just turn down your followers a little bit, Jesus? This is getting out of hand. Jesus' response was, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I believe that's what Dr. Bright is saying. I believe that's the spirit that the Apostle Paul is speaking here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I believe this is the attitude. This is the perspective that's at the heart of our mission and our purpose as a church family. It's on the wall out in the lobby. Is it in our hearts? If you know it, say it with me. That our purpose is to worship and glorify God. How? With joy and enthusiasm and to encourage others to draw closer to him. This is our Christ-centered purpose. It's led us to to do a number of things in the past few years that some thought were led from God and others thought were crazy. Our supporting the mission to the children in Ethiopia through Scott and Gigi Martell, a ministry to kids whose parents have died of AIDS. We built us, last year we built a school and a teacher's house and wells in the area of Mozambique, Africa. We've expanded the outreach of Operation Homebound in order to reach more people with more meals. We've completed our new fellowship building. We've expanded a youth ministry building area. We've launched the shepherd ministry to reach out to people in the communities that we live in. We've dedicated this year's Christmas Eve offering to reaching the homeless in the Ocala National Forest. And their pastor is going to be here in two weeks to speak to us. And I've, we're going to ask him, what will you do with this offering if you receive it? How do you want to make a difference in people's lives? This mission and this purpose has motivated us to give up our rights for the sake of encouraging others to draw closer. People in our community, in our nation, and in our world. What is it that allows us to get up our rights for the sake of winning other persons for Christ. I want to wrap up today by talking a little bit about a statement that St. Augustine created years ago. It's about having this attitude of reaching people for Christ. Here's what he says. He says, in essentials, we should have unity. In non-essentials, we should have diversity. And in all things, we should have love. Let's just look at him briefly. Number one, and essentials unity. Our Sunday mornings in worship, we have three services going on in two locations. We have the broadest, most diverse gathering at any time in the life of our church on Sunday morning. On Sunday mornings, we have everything from atheists to people from other religions, to people who are considering the Christian faith, to brand new Christians, to seasoned saints. 
Our unity is reflected in our common purpose to worship and glorify God with joy and enthusiasm to encourage others to draw closer to him. There was a church that had a sign they were really proud of. It was right when you pulled into their property. And the sign was about their faith. It says, it said, Jesus only. Jesus only. Well, one night there was a big storm. And the, when the people arrived at church for worship the next Sunday morning, the sign had changed. It now said, us only. Three of the letters had been blown away. Well, sadly, too many churches in our world today have become private clubs that exist for the membership. That's exactly where our purpose comes from. It's not about us. Worship is our ministry to God. Service is our ministry to other people, ones we're trying to encourage to draw closer to God. In five short verses in today's scripture, Paul describes his willingness to be where people are, to sacrifice his convenience, to give up his cherished traditions for the sake of winning people, he said, for Christ. Our goals call us to sacrifice and inconvenience ourselves for the sake of others. Did you notice the new signs when you pulled in today? There's some new signs out there that say first time guest parking. That means some of you and some of us on staff and those of us who are in leadership are going to sacrifice our convenience for the sake of reaching others and make it easier for first time guests to come into our midst. Five times in this passage, Paul repeats his purpose to become all things to all people for the sake of saving some. It's bigger than providing for our congregation's desires. It's bigger than our musical taste. It's bigger than our choir arrangement. It's bigger than our diverse traditions. It's bigger than any goals we've ever set because it's about, and everything is about encouraging others to draw closer to him. That drives us. It permeates everything that we do. This is the standard that decides whether we're a success or a failure. Here's the motivation, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This love for others, this purpose, it's what keeps this diverse family of faith unified in, in essentials unity. But here's number two, in non-essentials, diversity. Poster George Barna made the observation that Americans are most open to accept philosophies and people and programs that respond to their needs. They're looking for something that's fresh and exciting, something that's credible and substantive, something that's solid and flexible. Barna's analysis after many years of data gathering and research was this, that the Christian faith that is promoted in many churches today offers few of these traits. The churches that will make an impact on the future, according to Barna, are those whose congregations are willing to step forward with Paul's attitude and be willing to inconvenience themselves for the sake of encouraging others. One of our goals has been to create the additional worship service to reach baby boomers. That was people like many of you and me. The bonus has been we're reaching many families and children as well. How many people saw the movie Sister Act with Whoopi Goldberg? It's always amazing how many people have seen that movie. The movie wasn't very deep biblically, to make an understatement, but I believe it caught the spirit of Jesus and Paul that the movie wasn't deep biblically, but it came to reach out to those people who are there for the sake of reaching, for the sake of encouraging others, to draw closer to God. Colossians 4, verse 5. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Jesus says it in the Great Commission. 
Go and make disciples of who? All people. Thank you. That was a great hush when we said the word all. It's something from your heart. He says it all. It's not just half of our community, but all of our communities. Not just some generations. It's all generations who need Jesus. And I believe that he's choosing us to bring others closer to him. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, diversity. But the third thing is all things love. Familiar passage, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. I love the wise saying that goes this way. Blessed are the flexible, for they won't get bent out of shape. <laughs> love does that. Love sets you and me free to even disagree with one another. Love knows that unity does not depend on uniformity. And here's the clincher. The inability to identify with and love and minister to all kinds of people is causing the death of many congregations today. So Paul's message here and Jesus' message as he lived among all kinds of people, and remember Paul and Jesus were criticized for keeping the wrong company lots of times, was that there is a time when God calls us to be all things to all people for the purpose of encouraging others to draw closer to him. The reason we're here is to worship God with joy and enthusiasm. In her prayer, opening prayer, Becky said, sometimes we lose sight of why we're here. The reason we're here is to worship God with joy and enthusiasm and to encourage others to draw closer to him. I have a stack of magazines on the coffee table in my house and I have too many. And about every couple of weeks, they all fall over. And I was making up my mind that we we're, gonna get, we we're gonna ditch some of this stuff. And I started going through magazines and I ran across the magazine. It was an article about the Eiffel, the beloved Eiffel Tower in Paris. It was a story about how it wasn't beloved when they built it. As a matter of fact, the citizens hated it so much when it was new that they wanted that monstrous thing to be torn down as soon as the World's Fair was over. I don't want to sugarcoat it, but adding an additional worship service for us, if you recall, wasn't easy. Now we know it was the right decision. Building a children's ministry building was challenging for us. Doing a capital campaign, like reaching out for the campaign, created some misunderstanding. And many of you sacrificed dearly in order for that vision to become a reality. The, all these things were innovations created because of love. Love for men and women and boys and girls in this community who don't yet know Jesus Christ. Our attitude should be whatever it takes, whatever it takes. It's not about us only. Listen to Paul. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. My prayer is that the depth of our unity finds an expression in the breadth of our diversity for the sake of winning some for Christ. Christmas holidays are coming. It's that opportunity where people are thinking about spiritual things. I would challenge you, if you haven't done it already, I know many of you have, be thinking and praying about who you're going to invite to the Christmas concerts and the Christmas night at North Lake and to other possible events that we'll be offering. Be thinking about and praying about who those people are going to be because God wants to use you to reach people and to draw them closer closer to himself. Let's pray.
God, thank you for your goodness and for inviting us to be your partners and your purpose for this world. I pray that you'll bring to mind people, family members, neighbors, friends or acquaintances who would benefit by an opportunity to draw closer to you and have their lives changed. So be working in us now to provide those opportunities in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh...